All right, Michelle McPherson here, and we are on Crowd Mountain's Boot Camp Module 3 Q&A call. And let me bring up the questions here, and we'll get started. We've got uh, a fairly light load of questions this week, so if you do have any that you have been waiting to submit or weren't sure if, if there would be time to get to them or anything, there will be, so go ahead and submit them. Okay, first question from Jane. What do I think of the conduit method? the making of a fact sheet for each product. The fact sheet being the product name, the merchant's official domain name, brand, company name, product overview, features list, user feedback, etc. With this assembling of facts instead of article and post writing, I would think this approach would be faster in its construction and duplication. What is your opinion of the pros and cons of this and its SEO effectiveness as, a, as compared to what you've been showing us in your wonderful techniques and examples on con, of content-driven sites? The conduit method is fine, but it's a product-driven uh, method of attracting visitors to your sites and we're going for a keyword driven method of attracting visitors to our sites because we know that people are searching for certain long tail keywords so we are going to create content based on those keywords that we pick up that search engine traffic if you're in a niche where there are a lot of product driven keywords already as it might be in a uh, a niche for say you know the the Elmo toy that you know was big at Christmas several years ago and seems to have come back this year, or, you know, whatever, but people are searching for a particular product name over and over, then yeah, that could be something that's effective in your niche, but it just depends on the keywords that are coming out for your particular market. If they are, they are product-driven keywords, then creating a conduit method kind of post for those different products and their associated keywords could absolutely be effective. And again, it just depends on your niche, what kind of content you're going to post. And that's why we did the whole getting to know your niche sponge method, so that we know what kind of content other sites in our niche are posting and what other kinds of content are effective in our niche. Uh, Rochelle asks, I have a question regarding keywords and tags. My question applies to both meta tags and tag tags, like technorati tags. Do we need to add a space after the comma that separates multiple keywords or no, no space? I've seen it both ways, and I don't know if it matters one way or another. Uh, you can do it both ways. I've found it doesn't really seem to make a difference, and I tend to do it without a space. Allison asks, um, she has an e-commerce site about uh, a particular kind of bedding. I use similar niche keywords to the ones that I'm using in this project on her e-commerce site. For hosting reasons, her WordPress blog has to stand separate from the e-commerce site. How do you recommend I use the blog best to work with the e-commerce site? Should I link between the two, and if so, how? Um, in this case, you, well, it's best, and I assume that she's talking about because there's a hosting situation, that these two blogs are on different servers and have different IP addresses. Um, so you'd want to use your blog to link to your site your e-commerce site, you're talking about, say, a particular kind of, this is a bedding site, a particular, you know, duvet comforter, you would want to link to that product over at your e-commerce site so that people could buy it there, and that will help pass some link juice to the two and some natural traffic as people land on your blog because of the SEO benefits that we're going to be working out with it. Uh, then you can send them over to your e-commerce site to actually buy products. You can also, if you're doing... If you find that your blog takes hold really, really well and is getting a good amount of hits and you would like to somehow mm, bring those people from your blog to your e-commerce site which out, without like requiring them to go over to the e-commerce site and then say that they want to buy something, you can embed buy links from your e-commerce site onto your blog site so that then they're on your blog, they see a product that they like, they like your blog post with information about that particular product, and you can have a buy now link that does direct them to your e-commerce site, but it isn't saying, hey, go here for more information about this product. Instead, it's saying buy now or add to cart, and then they'll go over to your e-commerce site and have a shopping cart there. Rochelle asks, uh, I have a situation for where one of the long tail keywords I found from Market Samurai starts with the term... Um, I'm going to say turtles. I'm, I'm changing this up so that we're not giving away her niche. I know based on the rest of the keyword that there should be ninja turtles in front, and the keyword phrase really doesn't make sense unless ninja is at the beginning of it. I would like the difference. It would be like the difference between turtles action figures, which is not the actual phrase, and ninja turtles action figures. One makes sense, the other doesn't. So should I add the word 
turtles. No, ninja. Sorry, I'm getting confused <laughs> when I'm trying to uh, make this so that it's different from her niche. So should I add the word ninja to the phrase that I'm creating a post about or leave it off and use the phrase that Market Samurai generated? I would suspect, Rochelle, that in this case, in these keywords where you know that people are searching for something else, I would suspect that your um, broad to phrase for these phrases is fairly low. And you'll want to check that if, again, you're in a niche where uh, some things just don't make sense if you don't say the whole keyword phrase like Ninja Turtles versus just saying Turtles action figures. Uh, so check the PBR. If it's got a really high PBR, then you want to just keep it as it is because that means that you know that percent of the time, and let's say the PBR is 90, 90% 90 of the time people actually are typing in that keyword phrase as it's given to you in Market Samurai, and that just might be because users – uh, in the search engine, sometimes type in weird things, and, and we never know what's going to come up. But if the PBR is low, then you know that people are actually looking for something else, and yes, it would make sense to adjust that to fit your actual keyword phrase of, say, Ninja Turtles. Uh, Rochelle also asks, during your video tutorial of how to set up Google Reader, you showed us how to create folders so that we can keep track of feeds for multiple sites that we may have. How do we use this plugin and not show posts meant for site A on site B? In other words, how do we keep shared posts for multiple sites separate when using this plugin? And unfortunately, you can't because there's no way. It's not necessarily because of the plugin. It's because in Google Reader, your shared items page is just a mishmash of all of your shared items with no separation. So there's no way for the plugin to pick up the information from your individual folders because they're going off your shared items page, which is just all of your shared items. So the only way to do this in terms of having multiple websites using shared items and posting to these multiple websites is to have separate Google accounts that use a separate Google feed reader for each of them. Bob asks, uh, are you going to show us how to add nofollow links to our blogs, how and where to use them? Yes, we do talk about that, um, particularly in Module 4. Bob also asks, should we be submitting our content to bookmarking or 2.0 sites, or are we waiting to have a certain amount of content on our site first? Um, yeah, we're waiting until our site has a certain amount of content. We're waiting for our site to have some time, having been indexed in Google. And when we send out, when we write a new post, a ping goes out to the ping services, and those create some small links for us. So we're just looking to kind of let our site exist for a while before we hit it really hard with a bunch of links because having uh, doing that immediately when a site is launched is not necessarily the best strategy that you can have in Google's eyes. They tend to not like that at times. Bob also asks, do we keep writing articles on the first categories we started till we are done and then move to the next or keep mixing them up a little? Yeah, you should mix them up a little, absolutely. You don't want to just have one category stuffed full of stuff and then one category with nothing in it. So yeah, you want to mix up your category posts. And that's a duplicate. Kevin says, can or should we change the keywords for the images as well? Um, yes, you can, and it certainly doesn't hurt to do so. And I honestly, I didn't explain it in that video because uh, it can get kind of complicated for people who don't know how to work in the code that's given to you by PhotoDropper. Uh, but if you do know how to do that, you absolutely can. Next question is from Sam. Does Google give more weight to a WordPress page as opposed to a WordPress post? I wouldn't say that Google itself gives more weight to a page as opposed to a post. They can't look at them and necessarily determine a difference between them and say, oh, this is a post and this is a page. However, generally when you have a page, it's linked in the top of your, maybe in your site navigation, or it's going to be linked in your sidebar at all times, so it's going to have a site-wide link. Whereas a WordPress post doesn't have a site-wide link, unless it's a brand new post and it's showing up in a you know new post widget, and then it'll be gone from there once you have, let's say you're displaying five new posts, once you've got six new posts, that one will be bumped off. So a page is going to get a site-wide permanent link from your site, which indicates to Google that this is an important page on your site. And in that respect, a page can get more, we'll call it credit, in Google's eyes than an individual post. 
His next question is, do you use any WordPress plugins for automatically backing up my WordPress site? No. Uh, my host backs up my entire server for me, so I don't back up any individual sites or blogs or anything. Um, he also says, once you are ranked well and the site is getting traffic, how often do you need to post? That's very dependent on your niche. In a more competitive niche or in a niche where the sites that you are competing against happen to have new content all the time, you may need to continue to post very, very often. And in a less competitive niche, that won't be the case. And what I do to determine if that needs to happen is I just stop posting. And if I notice you know, within, say, two weeks that I'm losing rank, then I'll start posting again. And you can test around using that method of just stopping and seeing what happens. Uh, you can test with, say, only posting twice a week versus posting every day versus posting once a week and, and that kind of thing and, and see at what level of posting you can retain your rank. And every time that I've done that and I actually have lost rank, I have uh, been able to very quickly get it back once I start posting again. Um, Going back to Module 1, as we are looking at our competition's backlinks to page and domain, what numbers are doable? Knowing what you know about how we are going to backlink to our page, what is a good conservative number? Uh, to be entirely honest, Michael, I do not have a specific number because whether those backlinks are something that I can compete with depends on the other factors that are involved, which is, is that site optimized? How old is that domain? Is it a domain like Wikipedia or Amazon.com where there may not be many posts per page or many backlinks per page, but there are hundreds of thousands for the whole domain? So it's not something that, that you can say, oh, you know, anything more than 100 backlinks to the page and anything more than 2,000 to the domain I can't compete with. Because also, Sometimes a site will rank because uh, you know it mentions a keyword, but that site really isn't about that topic, and it could be a fairly powerful site. But once you actually put up something that's optimized in your meta tags and you know your H1 tag and all that stuff that we talked about, and that's optimized on page for a keyword, and then you build some links to it, it can outrank this otherwise very powerful site that is only ranking because it happens to mention that keyword but isn't actually related to it. So there's no hard and fast number. Um, when we're looking at backlinks to the page, you know, you're going to be building individual links to your page. You're also going to be building links to your domain. And these numbers that uh, Market Samurai gets come from Yahoo as opposed to Google. Google doesn't show all of the links that they know about for you. Um, so, you know, I'd love to give you a hard and fast answer, but it depends on the other factors as well. Domain age, if that site is optimized on page for that keyword, if that site is actually about that niche topic, and um, and and the overall authority of the domain. Anne asks, when looking at Market Samurai's SEO graph, how do you analyze the results? For example, if the domain names are all really old red, but the other factors are green, is that worth pursuing? That's a very similar question to what Michael just asked, and it it really just depends on all of the factors put together. You know, having just old domain domains on your front page, again, if they are unrelated to your niche as far as the rest of the content on their domain and they only have like one page that's related to your niche, then an old domain isn't necessarily something that is going to be difficult to compete with. So you have to actually, in this case, you know, you'll want to go to the pages and see what kind of content they're publishing as well and see if those sites are as, competitive as that graph might make them look. In general, if we're only dealing with old domains and the backlinks to page are very low and the backlinks to domain are very high because those are old domains, and the other factors like, you know, is it um, you know, H1 tag, meta tags and all that are green, then I would go for it, assuming that our other competition numbers uh, the SEO competition, title competition, etc., are acceptable. Um, oh no, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Graham, sorry. 
Um, just to let you know, I'm really enjoying the program so far and I'm getting a lot from it and I'm getting into ideas about how to improve the look and feel of my own site that I'm creating. I have a couple of questions. As my new site is mainly video oriented, I'm planning as part of my marketing campaign to send a couple of example videos, videos to video sharing sites like YouTube and so on. Do you know of any way that I can get the video on these sites to automatically redirect the viewer back to my site once they've viewed these videos? No, you can't do that. Which would be your preferred methods for building buzz about a new membership site aimed at newbie internet marketers? Um, that will be covered in Module 6. Sue asks, I found a domain name that I prefer to the one that I started with. Is it possible to move all the work I've done in WordPress to a new domain? Yes, it's possible, and if you just do a search on Google for uh, you know, how to move your WordPress blog to a new domain, You'll be able to find tons and tons of people who have given tutorials on that. Um, Sue also asks, when searching for long tail keywords, should we keep or eliminate those that contain the word free? For example, uh, with my site, would you keep free maple syrup cleanse on my site? Um, that's a really good question. And I would say, if you are on a very, very product-specific site, like we were talking about um, Ninja Turtles earlier. So if we're doing a site about different Ninja Turtle action figures, I would not use the free in that because that's a product that people need to purchase to get the information on, and they're not going to do me any good if they don't actually intend to purchase a Ninja Turtle action figure. So free Ninja Turtle action figures, no. Now on my site, because it's more of a softer information kind of niche, so someone's looking, say, for a free master cleanse recipe, then yes, I would use the free keywords because um, I can give them the free master cleanse recipe, and then I can also tell them that uh, most people fail on the master cleanse when they start because it's really, really hard to do a juice cleanse immediate, you know, uh, your first time around. And that I found all these resources in this ebook about how to make your first, uh, you know, master cleanse successful. So, uh, in my case, I would. In a product-centered site, I probably would not. Norm asks. When looking for long tail keywords, I notice a trends graph of a large majority of them exhibit, exhibiting a dramatic decline in the last two months. The decline is often in the order of 80 to 90 percent and is applicable to the primary keywords in several niches I experimented with, none of which I would expect to be seasonal. Should this be considered as significant? Um, assuming, Norm, here that you were looking at lots and lots of different keywords, uh, then I would anticipate that that decline may be because of the Christmas rush. Uh, no matter what niche you're in, if there's something that people can buy, the searches go up during Christmas and then decline in the months or two or three afterwards, obviously, because people are no longer attempting to buy those products for their friends and family. Uh, so assuming, again, that you're looking across a wide variety of markets and you're not just in one niche that could have had some sort of decline for whatever reason, then I would guess that it's because uh, Christmas stuff has gone down. Rochelle asked a few questions about creating posts with keywords to posts. I believe that prior to WordPress 2.7, WordPress did not ping on future dated posts. Do you know if this is still true with WordPress 2.7? I thought that that was fixed in like, you know, 1.8, but I could be wrong. Uh, regardless, what you're doing with the keywords to post plugin, it's creating drafts for you. You're not actually publishing those posts. So they aren't future dated in terms, of, they do have a future date on them, but when you hit the publish button, when you actually add content to that, that is a new post and it will be pinged. Uh, you said to include both the keyword phrase and the category name as tags. Do we need to include the category name somewhere in the post? No, you don't, but you can if it's relevant and is natural to do so. Rochelle also asks, with the Photo Dropper plugin, which do I think is better, to have the image at the beginning of the post in the middle or at the end? I usually put my images at the beginning because I base my post around what images I can find, so it's natural for me just to initially find an image and then write something about it, and that makes the writing of the post easier because you don't have to come up with an idea on your own. And sorry, I'm going to take a sip of my, uh, my Gatorade. Okay. 
Okay, uh, but I don't think it matters in the end as far as SEO value, as far as where in the post you include that image. <clears throat> Jana says, first, just got to say your course and instruction are top notch. Thank you, Jana. Question about Photo Dropper. I installed the plugin and it just won't bring back any pictures no matter what keyword I enter. I checked the download page and read the comments and there are others having trouble getting it to work. Any idea on why it might not be working for me? No, I haven't heard of that with Photo Dropper at all. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I, I wish that, uh, that I could give you a solution, but yeah, I haven't heard of that. The only times that I've had it not return photos for me is when my own Internet connection was really slow and it wasn't able to connect to the Flickr database. Uh, so I wish that I had something else to tell you about that, Jana, but hopefully the plug-in author is, uh, is notified and working on a fix. James asks, my main keyword is three words long and my category keywords are only three or two words long. Is that a problem? Uh, in general, a category keyword phrase should be as many or more keywords long than your main keyword phrase. Like we're talking about juice cleanse, I would not use juice or cleanse as a category keyword phrase because we're talking about creating a silo structure where we're going from the big to the little. Rochelle asks, with Google Reader, is it okay to remove an article from being shared as a way to use a single Google account for Google Reader? I noticed that we can remove a shared article and the articles I want to use on a post stays on my site even after I remove it from sharing on Google Reader. Yeah, I get what you're saying, Rochelle, and, and so you would share a bunch of things and then in your uh, Google Shared Items plugin, you would press the like post now button that's in there and then it would post all those and then you could remove them from your shared items and then move on to a different niche and a different set of shared items and yeah you could do that I don't see why not uh, it's just some juggling but you'd have to juggle with creating multiple logins if you wanted to do it that way too so it's it's entirely up to you which way you feel is easier and Rochelle also asks Creating articles for categories using keywords to post. How many articles should we add per, per category to get the site started? I noticed that I could add hundreds of long tail keywords from my, from my Market Samurai research if I really wanted to, and I'm sure I don't want to go quite that crazy off the bat. So, yeah, if you've got a market where you have lots and lots and lots and lots of long tail keyword phrases, then I would focus on the ones that actually get some traffic first. Uh, so, you know, depending on your numbers, if you're in a market where, you know, there's tons and tons of keywords that are getting over, say, you know, 50 searches a day, then start with those. If you're in a market where most of the keywords are only getting, you know, 10 to 20 searches a day, and then you've got a couple that are getting a bunch more, and then tons and tons and tons under that that are getting, like, no searches per day or one or two, then, you know, start with the mid-level ones that are getting 10 to 20 so that you're picking up keywords that actually are getting some traffic. And let's see if anything else has come in in the meantime. Those were all the questions. So I will check uh, my, my queue. All right, here's another one. Okay, Rochelle asks, if we add photos with the Photo Dropper plug into our blogs and the photos are later deleted from Flickr, will the images still be on our blogs? No, they will not be. They will be, uh, they'll be gone. And that's why it's important, like I had on a blog um, <laughs> where I was posting photos, uh, you know, with the Creative Commons license and I said I was a commercial blog, so it was only searching for photos that could be used for a commercial purpose and this guy apparently didn't understand how he had licensed his photos and got all upset that I was um, using his photos on my blog even though you know I credited him and it was within his Creative Commons licensing. He actually complained to the affiliate company that I was doing affiliate stuff with and my hosting company about it. He deleted all the images from Flickr so then they were no longer on my blog. And uh, and then I had to uh, explain what was going on to my hosting company and my affiliate company, and it all worked out because he had his photos licensed wrong. It wasn't my fault. But uh, but yeah, if someone deletes things, then they are gone forever from your site. 
but uh, that's the only time I've actually encountered that as a real problem. I've seen on some of my sites that, you know, a photo author will occasionally remove a photo now and again just because they don't want it up on their Flickr anymore for whatever reason, but uh, it's few and far between. Most people put stuff up on Flickr for the long term. And I'm checking one more time to see if there are any new questions that have come in. Okay, we don't have anything new, so I'm going to uh, open up the lines briefly. If anybody is live on the call and would like to ask a question, then they can do so. So let's see, I do this. Okay, you guys are unmuted now, and if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask, go ahead. Hi, Michelle. It's Rochelle. Hey there. I wasn't able to get to the Tuesday one, so if this has already been asked, I apologize. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of us are having problems with the redirection plug-in. Mm -hmm. Do you have any solutions, any recommendations? You know, I saw the solution that you posted, yeah. which was deleting the old redirections and then uh, unchecking, unchecking the monitor. Exactly. And uh, I haven't encountered the problem on any of my own sites, so I, I can't say. Uh, yeah, I've got two that work that didn't work with that and one that seems fine so far. <laughs> Weird. Well, do you know if the plugin author is going to be attempting to fix it or what? Does he know what the problem he is? Has stated, he has acknowledged that there's something going on on his website, and, and by acknowledging, all really he has done is offer the uncheck the options uh, the monitoring options. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else came in with the other solution, and he has not said anything else about it. So as far as I'm concerned, he's aware of it, but I have no idea if he's going to do anything. Okay. Um, well, I I love that plugin. <laughs> I've been using it for years, so I really don't want to see it uh, not work out. So um, I'm writing a note here for myself. And the problem that I'm finding is even if we do those steps that I wrote down and then we post new posts, that's when it causes problems again. Huh. And so you have to constantly monitor your site yeah, to which see is if no there's good. a problem or not. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, I will see what I can do to either encourage that guy to fix it or to have a private programmer fix it because, uh, because it's a good plug-in. Okay. Um, and then I think you mentioned, too, that, that you use something else to control your, your links like that. Are you using anything, a WordPress plugin, or are you using like a... It, uh, it is. I just went out and searched for a, a monitoring plugin, and it's called SEO Platinum Pack, so which that does, does every, that. It does, and it does everything else that the all-in-one SEO does, and then some, including that. Okay. And I tested it to see if it really does, and it does. But what it doesn't do is force, well, there is a plug-in that will force the WWW or not, uh, but it doesn't strip off the the ending, the PHP, HTML, yeah. to okay. prevent duplicate content. But I haven't looked to see if there's anything else that will do that. Okay. Well, I'll look into to that as well and uh, and see if we can come up with something either a fix to the redirection or a different setup that will work on, uh, on everyone's site since this does seem to be giving problems to multiple people. So. Sounds good. Uh, any other questions? Going once, going twice, and I'll check the email queue one more time. And if there's nothing else waiting, then we'll be done for the day. Let's see. Well, since I got you, I do have another question. <laughs> <laughs> you ask awesome questions, by the way. So I so feel go like ahead. I'm on, it's just completely monopolizing this. But <laughs> I'm sure I'm everyone else is benefiting from them now. No. Yeah, it's my overthinking ability that, that does this. Um, <laughs> I've noticed that this is incredibly detailed and time-consuming. And how many sites do you recommend we try and work on at once? And I realize it's kind of hard to answer because not everybody is at home all the time. But... Without it's, getting too thin on any given site, you know, I, I can't say because it's it's everybody's individual abilities. You know, some people it it might take them, uh, you know, a little bit longer, say, to write a post because they aren't writers. 
Um, you know, some people, it might take them longer to set up a site because they're just getting used to, you know, how to deal with FTP and activating plugins and all that kind of stuff. I can say that once you've done it several times, it doesn't take as long to set up a site, you know, and, and get content up and all that kind of stuff and have it optimized. Once you've done it several times, you know, it would take me maybe two hours to do, yeah. you know, and then I get my posting on and go from there. And, like, I have uh, on a lot of my sites, I have people who uh, I outsource the content writing to, except I don't require them to actually write content. I require them to post a picture uh, with the Photo Dropper plugin, and then they use a, you know, two to four sentence description talking about the picture. Mm-hmm. And I'm using the Keywords to Post plugin so that they know what they should be writing about, what they should looking for, be looking for a picture about. And those kinds of people cost me about, you know, maybe $4 a week to do one site, if that. So, you know, and I'm talking, obviously, we're outsourcing to non-native English speakers, and it can take a time or two before you find somebody whose non-native English is good enough. Mm-hmm. But if you Are choose you some- to- I'm sorry. If you choose to go that route uh, with the outsourcing, you can get decent content from people using a photo dropper plugin and asking them to just write a couple sentences. It's not that hard for them if they're not native English speakers. It's still simple enough that they can do, and they can be had very, very, very cheaply. Do you give them access to your site then? Yes. Okay. Are you familiar with PLR Pro as a site? Uh, I think I've heard of it. Uh, well, then you probably can't answer. I was going to wonder what your opinion is of using that kind of content from a reputable PLR source, not one that thousands of sites have. Yeah, I use, um, actually, for private label content, I use um, Content Effects, I think it is. Content and then FX. Uh, But the problem with that, you know, any private label content is that, in general, you will find it in other sites, and it's not unique content. But you can mix up your blog with some unique content versus non-unique content. And I'm also testing a a WordPress plugin that will take private label or other duplicate content, and it will, I I guess I could call it mask it in such a way that... Is it? Can I say what I think you're talking about? Sure. Originizer? No, I haven't no, heard of okay. that one. Um, but I'll write that down to check it out. <laughs> no, I, I don't think it's a good thing to use. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it turns it into Java, uh, JavaScript, yeah, the one there, that doesn't get indexed. Okay. Where it doesn't read it. So you might check to make sure that doesn't happen with what you're testing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'll it'll change the content, and like I said, I'm testing it and seeing how it works out, seeing if those pages still get indexed correctly and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we will see if that works out, and that would be a solution for people who want to use private label content uh, but don't want to have the duplicate content penalties. What's your opinion on spinning? Spinning is great, as okay. long as it's a readable spin. Okay. Yeah, it's it's... It, you don't want to use necessarily a, a – you need to write the spins yourself. You know what I'm saying? You can't use yeah. something that spins content for you yeah, uh, based on synonyms. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because that won't make any sense. But if you write the spins yourself, you know, and it, it, they take a while sometimes. But, you know, if you spend the half hour or an hour to write a good spun article, you can get a lot of traction out of it. Although uh, I do tend to use spun articles not so much for blog content but for linking purposes. And we'll talk about that in the next module. Okay. Uh, module five. So that's all I have. Okay. Uh, anybody else come up with anything in the meantime? All right. Then we are all set. Thank you guys all for coming to the Q and A session, and thank you all for submitting your questions ahead of time so that we had some lovely things to talk about while we were here. And uh, uh, this call is, of course, recorded, so if you weren't able to listen to the whole thing or you came in late, you can get the beginning. It will be uploaded to the site in the next uh, couple of hours. And we'll talk next week at the Module 4 Boot Camp Q&A. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.